Welcome to the most exciting and awaited Otis International Youth Day panel session. With champions, you are nurturing their talents and transforming lives of those around them and beyond them. Uh, my name is Farha Abdakhak, and I'm really glad to join you again for another session for this webinar. Today, we hope to do uh, a conversation that we exchange will elevate, inspire, and awaken. To do that, today we have Lillian, who is an amazing self-taught artist with a background in finance and banking. She's also the OD Young Person of the Year. With her, to add a little bit more inspiration, we have Rebecca. She is a teacher and a social entrepreneur who leads the CODA enterprise that aims to foster inclusivity for the deaf community. And to add more perspective uh, regional, about in, regional integration, about youth policies, we have Christian, who's a researcher and a teacher uh, and the deputy executive director of European Horizon. And he's passionate about promoting regional integration and sustainable development. Uh, with that note, I would like to welcome all of you. How are you? I'm doing very well and I'm really excited to be talking with all of you and both sharing some of my experiences and thoughts and learning learning a lot from you all as well. All right, so I just wanna start off by asking um, just something very basic. A lot of young people do not believe that, that they're important or is skilled enough to create a difference in their society. What do you think your work as youth leaders is helping uh, achieve the sustainable goal uh, of development. And I just want to ask by what do you understand by youth engagement? How do I know I'm an engaged youth? How do I measure? So I just want to start off by with Rebecca. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for ha having me. Hello, Rebecca. Okay, so Youth engagement. I hope you can hear me. I'll go to uh, Christian while I think there's an issue with her microphone, Hello. Rebecca. Okay, Rebecca, we can hear you. We can go ahead. Okay. So about youth engagement. To me, youth engagement is youth voice, youth involvement, youth activeness, and participation. So for, for you to say you are engaged, that means you are involved from the lowest of your own community. So I'm talking about the local community. You are involved in its development. It doesn't have to be something big. So if I am engaged, I am involved in the process, in the development of my locality, of that community where I am. Okay, can we go to Christian? Christian, what do you, what do I as a youth, uh, when you're talking about role, my role in national policy, my role in a society, my role in international development, my role uh, as a youth in the private sector. How do you foresee I should be seeing my role playing in those areas? And how, how do I engage myself? How do I know I'm valued? How do I know I'm a part of it? Well, I think Rebecca really hit the nail on the head. Voice, involvement, and activeness are three of the key characteristics which define youth engagement. And I think one of the key kind of examples that we can take of this is the climate movement that has emerged across the entire world. We're also seeing more recently a really great campaign against racism and discrimination across the world as well. And what these young leaders, for instance, Greta Thunberg, uh, who is from Sweden as well, have been doing is they've really raised their voice. They're combining their voice with uh, kind of a very active and creative form of participation and engagement. And then on top of that, what they're also able to do is through this voice, they're able to bring issues to the attention of policymakers. And this is one of the things which I wanna talk a little bit more later about is how you as a youth or as a youth organization can 
bring your ideas and your passions to the attention of policymakers or stakeholders in the private and public sector. And what they're doing is they're creating unique ways of telling the story of what they're trying to achieve. So another great example, which I was just alerted to a few uh, a few weeks ago through someone who was also connected to Opportunity Desk is about this organization called Ethiopia Reads, which is working to improve literacy in Ethiopia. And what they're doing is they're partnering with uh, the, the local governments and municipalities in Ethiopia, and they're raising the voice, they're raising awareness for this issue of literacy in Ethiopia. And as such, they're able to engage young people in order to achieve this greater goal. And I think that combination, which I hope we're gonna delve a little bit deeper into later on, um, is really the, the crux of what defines youth engagement. And there's many more great examples of this, which I'm sure we're gonna talk about later. Sure. Um, I just wanna to go to Lillian right now. Lillian. Hello? Yes, Lily. Yes, we can hear you. Lily, I just well, want to ask, yeah, the same question to you. Um, how do you think your work as a youth leader is helping achieving kind of those sustainable goals? Um, and how do you feel that um, a youth should be engaged in their society, in their community, in, 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 a, in a more progressive or more engaged way? Well, uh, I would say that for me to be engaged and for me to participate, if for start, for, I mean, I have to be active first. And by being active, I mean, I have to participate in different programs and, and, and given opportunities. And also I, I, I would say opportunities that are given should also address the youth and allow them to participate in different matters governing their societies and their government in, in party and also. Okay. So that's excellent. Um, Lillian and Rebecca, if if we if I may ask you, um, you both work in the intersection of art, culture, and identity. Um, in that process, how do you advocate authenticity to help young people bring the best out of themselves? despite the flaw and the raw and the perfection and beauty we have in our own way, how do, we, how do you help youth embrace and accept that uniqueness? And how do you kind of help them express themselves and then create that transformational change uh, within their area? And from an art perspective, culture and identity perspective. Okay, okay. so the truth is uh, that it is not it is not very easy, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think the main reason why I have been able to push this far is the, is the fact that I was born in that kind of community. So my main focus is to advocate for the inclusion of the deaf community. And there's this one thing I always work with, nothing with horse, without horse, even for the youth. That slogan should be our main priority, nothing with us without us. So you can't say you are advocating for anyone and you are doing it without them. They have to be actively involved. They have their voices has to be there. Their ideas, their opinions, it's very important. So the way we've been able to do this, or I have been able to do this is from the grassroots. So when I started this, I started with the people I was addressing. I started with them. I, I mingled with them. I had a group and, you know, talk with them, sit on the table, talk with them. Oh, so what do you think? What are the problems? How do we address this? What do you want? How do you, what do you think other people can do to help address this issue you have? And so far, with, um, with a lot of research, with a lot of, you know, working with people that live with disabilities, we've come to know that a lot of their issues goes down to stigma, discrimination, and lack of quality of education. And we are not entirely going to blame, 
the hearing communities because like i said it's an active thing it's a thing that we have to do together nothing with us without us so we are we we, we are structured in a way whereby we are working with both communities oh this is our problem this is what we need and in the other side oh this is why it is like this with us this is why we are discriminating or oh, this is why we don't understand so our work has been based on this on both sides you know after having done this many research with these people at the at the grassroots then we pick it up from there so when, when we are addressing this problem we are not just addressing it in okay we are dealing with the deaf people okay so this is uh, guys this is the problem we solve it. no 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 you have to work with everyone but right there where you are and we are doing it right there where we are we're involving everyone both the deaf both the hearing because if we are going to achieve a sustainable community like we want to have everyone has to be involved and that has been our foundation everyone has to be involved everyone Rebecca, I had a question, like, as a deaf, someone who belongs to the deaf community, if I want to work as a fully participant in the economy, as a, in the private sector, do you face any challenges of um, advocating to companies to hire them to be that productive employee? Do you face challenges? What kind of challenges do you face in the private sector to have them function as a fully, a fully functional citizen? Okay, so first of all, don't forget that even we, uh, the, the youth ourselves, now I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna start with people living with disabilities, I'm not gonna start with the deaf people, even we ourselves, employment is a very big issue in this part of the country where we are from. So now imagine someone living with disability, the deaf person out there. Employment is a very, very great issue here. Now, working with stakeholders, private organizations to employ a deaf person to work with them, oh my, it has been a very tasking thing and it's still a major problem we are still trying to address. There are other organizations that, I, that I'm aware of that have been able to set up uh, a kind of a training program that trains the deaf individual and make them ready for for jobs, make, make them more employable. But it hasn't been so great of a turnout because the issue of employment itself to our youth normally is still a major problem. So we have a very, a very large percentage of the deaf people that mm -hmm. are not employed, a very large percentage. If you look at most of them, they are either entrepreneurs, traders, teachers, and we as an organization, we are open to do more in that area, really. We are, we are trying to engage stakeholders to hold them accountable for the human rights that are stated that no person with disability should be discriminate, discriminated based on, their, based on their disability, but it's not like that. So we are working in that area to advocate more for the inclusive, a more inclusive society that can allow a deaf person you know, get job easily out there. But first of all, like I said, don't forget, even the youth still have a major job problem. So it's, we are tackling this all together, all together. Okay. I want to bring in Lillian um, with the same question. Um, you work in the intersection of culture and art. Um, art and culture is something that people tend to feel it, it doesn't produce anything tangible, something we shouldn't pay attention to. How do you use art to bring out the the, the potential in, in, in youth and how do you kind of harness that into an outcome that is conducive to the individual and the society if i can just try to understand more of what you do and how you kind of empower people to help them connect with themselves and connect with others and and create a change well well, simply I can say by just telling stories, stories of hope, stories of stories that inspire them to be more than what they're doing right now. And also to add on the youth engagement with the people with disability, I'm also a person with, with disability. You may, 
in you may engage youth with this, with disability but they are not fully participated fully participating meaning they just there as a they can just be there they I mean they engaged you can say they engaged but then they're not fully participating and with with art people it's true people don't really see it as something to take it serious i mean they just say it's a hobby you can just do that but then art transforms art is ther therapeutic and it is it is something that we should also look at it we should also be more involved with it because stories told through art are really are really are really inspirational and the stories they are really good stories stories that can really change I, I, for me art i can say i will talk on my side with me art has helped me a lot i mean it, it has helped me find a purpose it has helped me know what i want to do and it is for me it's something that is really important Done. Yes, Lillian, it's interesting you mentioned about stories. Um, I, I, with that, I want to shift to uh, a bit more to Christian, who was focused on youth activist, uh, active like activism and engagement in at a transnational level, uh, in a more regional level. Uh, Christian, how do you kind of embed the voices of and the stories of youth? into let's say private sector regional policy making national policy making it just doesn't come up do you feel it comes up do you think in your work do you feel it comes up i feel like it comes up to a degree but clearly not enough i think when you look at both the private and public sector as well as kind of the differences with between countries and this is true both in Europe and the United States, where I'm most familiar, but also across the world, to be very clear, you see a lot of companies and um, governments and other kind of public organizations, they do have initiatives which work to include youth. Maybe they have uh, a conference, for instance, a few years ago, I attended a major conference by the European Union that was hosted in Romania, which gathered young people to talk about the future of Europe. And this was a really interesting event that engaged a lot of the people there, but, and I think this is the really important point, what impact did the opinions and the voices of the youth who were at that conference have ultimately on the decision-making of the government, uh, of the governing body of the European Union? And probably, probably fair to say, not too big of an impact. And that kind of, that experience is one that is seen across the world and perhaps to an even larger degree in certain settings and in certain countries. And so because of that, it is really important that young people think creatively about ways to maximize and amplify their voice. One of the ways which I think is really effective, especially if you think about the private sector, is for young people to work together, to network together both amongst each other and to provide themselves with a platform net to network with people um, who are, who are already involved in companies and already working for these companies to be able to have job opportunities and to also be able to shape the direction and the policies and the values of a company. And so it's, it's a, a bit of both of young people in different countries working together to gain networking opportunities and other professional opportunities. And also for these same young people that when they are in a company to work to make it easier uh, to recruit more young people and also to shape the values and the mission of this company. And so I think that's the really important point there. And I think broadly speaking, you can say across the world that in some instances, governments and private organizations say, say good, but the important point is to not only say good, but also do good. And I think that is where governments need to do a lot more. Interesting. Um, you feel there is a gap. Uh how do we kind of let's talk about uh, exchanging information from youth from one continent to another continent what mechanism do you think we as young people interact with other people at a regional level more what do you think companies and transnational organizations should do to kind of foster that greater interregional dialogue to kind of have more uh, exchange of information between youths in different regions. How do you see that kind of 
shaping or is it happening or does it need to have more? Well, it is happening through conferences and different types of events, but clearly it needs to happen a lot more, especially I'm most familiar with Europe and even in Europe where you have quite strong cooperation between countries, the national experiences of youth in different countries is vastly, vastly, vastly different. And so countries and also companies need to do more to engage young people from different regions. And I think there's a really good opportunity present right now. This public health crisis has forced us to move digitally, has forced us to move online. And while that is challenging and disrupting, it also provides us with an enormous opportunity to have many different types of events. For instance, uh, European Horizons, which was the organization that I used to be the deputy executive director of, yeah, just yesterday or two days ago, I forget exactly, had a terrific event where they brought digital experts, so experts on the digital economy uh, who were young, so youth experts who are working in this field, they brought them on and they had a panel with them talking about some of the issues that young people were working on to shape the digital economy and the digital politics really of the European Union in the next few years. And I think that's a great example of, let's just say you're a youth organization working in a different region of the world. That's something that you could do as well. Bring on young people who are experts on a particular field, have an event and engage people from different regions. For instance, if you're working in say South America or in Africa or in Asia, that's a great example. And I think broadly speaking, taking this pandemic and the changes that it has forced us to adopt, taking it and viewing it as an opportunity to actually reach out to more people than you did before, rather than having an in-person conference, having a digital conference where you invite people from even more countries than you used to, and as such both be able to network with people from different countries, uh, gain greater connections, and also to teach those people about the work that you do. So I think there is a lot more that governments and companies need to do, but I also think there's a lot of opportunity right now, which is actually quite exciting when you think about the years ahead. Interesting, uh, Kristen, you mentioned, I think due, due to the COVID, um, everything just moved into that digital sphere and there is this restructuring happening in the economy and a lot of people have lost their jobs and a lot of people might have lost their voices, which they had before. But there is this opportunity to reshape and refocus uh, on the digital sphere. Um, in terms of companies, uh, those who invest in, let's say, citizenship employees obviously become stronger, happier and more productive. And they obviously have a more capacity for empathy and inclusivity, which obviously fosters more better citizenship and a better value for companies. Have you had an opportunity where you if you could share an example um, where you could, were, were able to advocate to a company to, let's say, have this policy or have this strategy to include more youth uh, in their strategy. Is there an example you can share? What should, you know, me as an average citizen should be doing to kind of reach out? Because companies are not coming to us asking us. So how, how do we reach out to them? Is there any specific strategies you, you can share with us? Well, over the past year, I was working as a teacher here in Sweden, and I was working with middle school students, so students who are a little bit younger than what we are. But the students had a democratic forum, an aliyev ruad, they call it, where they can raise issues to teachers and the principal and the staff. And as a part of the staff, I made really big, uh, made really sure to always read in depth and really to think about and to process what the young people were advocating for what they were saying, why they were saying it, kind of putting yourself in the mind of that person. And as a result of that, uh, I was able to, when speaking with other teachers, really advocate for some of these positions, which maybe would not have otherwise have uh, arisen. And I think that is a great parallel that you can use in your company or in your organization. If you're working with people, either people who are younger than you, people who are older than you, and you get their input, you listen to them, you understand where they're coming from, and then you advocate in the forum that you have. That might be, for instance, maybe you have a weekly meeting. Most companies have a weekly meeting. Maybe then you bring to attention at that meeting. These are some of the big issues that I've heard are really important to a lot of employees at our company or in our organization. Here's what I think we should do about it, and here's why we should do that. And if you are persistent in that, and if you are 
um, you have good arguments and hopefully also some other support from your fellow employees, whether you're working in a small organization or a startup company, or if you're working in a big organization or a, uh, a major company, you will be able to shape the direction of the values of that company. There are some exceptions, of course, to this rule, but broadly speaking, I think that is a fair thing that you should always strive for. And there are quite a few different avenues to do that. You can also think about, for instance, working with human resources in your company, or if you're at a university, joining a, an activities board or joining kind of the student governing board and trying to shape the university or the organization from there. So there are quite a few avenues which you can do that. Great, thank you so much, Kristen, for that. Really appreciate it. Um, I wanna shift a gears to Lillian and Rebecca. We both work in, in such amazing uh, space in your countries and in, in your organization. I just wanna ask if you had a chance to speak to a policymaker tomorrow about changing certain policies towards youth engagement, whether it's in health, whether it's in education, tech, uh, women empowerment, uh, children's well-being, what would you tell them? Imagine someone can change uh, a policy overnight for you. What would you tell them? What have you achieved? What you know from the ground? And what would you tell them that they don't know? Rebecca? I'm sorry, Rebecca, I believe you're muted. Can we go to Lillian? Well, what I would, I would, uh, I would tell to this policy maker is that they should not overlook the grassroots, especially starting with the children. I believe teaching children creativity, it, it builds them. It builds, the, it builds the creativity and not only their creativity, the ability to think for themselves, the ability to do more things for themselves. And that is one of the most basic because you're building a generation that will be, we, we want a generation that will be able to advocate for itself, especially youth. And with youth, youth engagement, I would advise that they create more platforms. Platforms are there, but they should be, be they, they should be more. They should be more so that youth could all could could know about these opportunities and for them to be engaged. And I would also, I mean, the I once the first time I was able to go out there and show my string arts. It was when I, I was invited into a camp. It was a Tanzania Youth Coalition, Pan-African Youth Camp. 20. It was 2018. Yes. We, I was doing it at home. I was just staying at home. And by, by the time I, was, I got that opportunity to participate in a camp and meet my fellow youth and know what they're doing, it actually opened my mind. It, it broadened my way of thinking. It, it created a space for me where I could learn, network, and also go home and do more. So these platforms where youth can meet, learn, and just learn from each other and talk, it, it's, it's really important for them to broaden them, to broaden their knowledge and all that. And I would also add in my, my, but my most, most emphasis would be on children. Children are our generation and advocating for them and helping them, it would be really important. They, there should also be platforms for children and also youth. Brilliant, thank you so much, uh, Lillian. That's such a wonderful recommendation. You start with the children. If you if you want to have a active youth community, it, the investment should be begin with children. Christian, I wanna to shift to, to you with that, the same question, what would you, Tell a policymaker if you had a chance, if you're meeting him next, let's like say tomorrow, if, if you have a choice of just one policy that you could advocate and you know it's going to be implemented, what would that be? I think the biggest thing, and this goes just back to what was just said, um, is to invest in education 
I think education, both for very young, uh, very young children, so preschool in, in some countries is what they call it, and then for students in the elementary school, middle school, high school, basically anywhere up to 18, and higher education is super important. It is the most important investment that a government can make. I personally think that an investment in education is as important as an investment in terms of allowing people to start businesses or investing in some other social structures because when you invest in the next generation, that generation is going to be able to not only be able to compete in, in, in a very globalized market, but they will also be able to produce the technological, cultural, and more social change, which is super important within a country. And I think also more broadly within the world today, when we're faced with this massive climate crisis and other crises as well. Um, and it's just really important to be able to develop new, innovative, and highly developed technological research. And so investing in education everywhere from the very youngest kids all the way up to those obtaining their PhDs is really important. And this could be both investing in facilities, investing in sort of the material. You can think about the textbooks or you can think about digital materials like an iPad or a Chromebook, which is what is used in many Swedish schools, um, or investing in uh, scholarships to be able to study in different parts of the world. So you increase kind of the, the outlook and the mindset of your students. And also, of course, having plenty of options for research grants for universities and for high level researchers to be able to do that cutting edge research. Another great example of that, of course, right now, we're dealing with a massive global health crisis and we're seeing on a daily basis breakthroughs in the medical technology. Uh, I'm following very closely the development of this vaccine and this is going to continue in the future. There's going to be other crises. There's going to be other needs. And so investing in education is good right now, good tomorrow, and good in the future. I'm going to shift to Rebecca with the same question. If we have Rebecca up. Rebecca, can you unmute yourself so that we can hear your thoughts? OK. OK. Just like Kristen and Lillian has said, I very much agree with it. I was going to start with children and basically because my focus is more on people living with disability, I'll talk about the deaf children. One of the challenge we have in Nigeria is early language acquisition for a deaf child. It is really a major problem and it's affecting the quality of education our deaf children has. You see a lot of deaf children out there, they have a, a lot of them, a higher percentage has literacy problem. And it's not because they can't understand or they can't use proper English, but it has been a foundational background. The, the, the reason where a, a stage whereby they can't even acquire, you know, sign language early enough, you go to our primary schools, our secondary schools, they are not, they are not well structured. Now I'm talking about the government setting, the public schools here. They are not well structured and it's affecting a lot of our deaf children. And you can imagine if the foundation has been affected, what do you expect? So a lot of them grow up and they are not ready for what the society has to give to them, has to offer them. They are not ready for it in terms of information, in terms of exposure, in terms of, you know, quality education, in terms of networking. They are not ready for it because the foundation has been affected. So I'm going to tell our government, they need to put more into the education of a deaf child. They need to put more into the teachers that you know, teaches them in school. They need to put more into the development of our own national sign language. They need to put, you know, processes in place that will, that will not let a deaf child be left out, that will not let a deaf child feel like they can't be up to their hearing counterparts because that is a major problem. I see a lot of them and they feel like, oh, English, English language, if there's a barrier, I can't understand it. It's not... It's it's not well articulated with sign language. And I'm like, no, you look at other countries, you look at the sign language length in other countries, and you see them, they can use the English well. So the sign language should not be the barrier, but our own setting has become our own barrier. So we can't leave them out. If we really want a, 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 a structure 
in a, a, an environment that is fully developed and have everyone, everybody's potential, you know, harnessed into its development. We can't leave anyone out. No one is less. So our government has to involve everyone, either hearing or non-hearing. They have to involve them. They have to invest more into education at all levels. We don't leave in anyone. On how I'm not just talking about the hearing education, I'm talking about even the deaf education. They can't leave them out, they have to bring them all in. And I know, see, one thing I am certain of is that if we can focus on this aspect, we are going to really experience, you know, a huge growth in our economic because they've been left out for so long it's like they they are, they are not noticed they are, you know they, they look like oh the less is expected of them but if we give them this opportunity if our government can put more into them you know invest into them we'll be amazed at what many things they can do at what many things they can achieve as well i'm, I'm looking at innovation now the innovations we have now um, uh, kristen said a lot of things about you know technology digital age it has really left them behind as well. They can't even participate. I've, I, I've seen a lot of, you know, I've been in a, in, in a lot of webinars, in a lot of conference where they can't even participate. So now, mm -hmm. how, are we, how are we making them to progress? How, are, how, are we, how, how can we harness those potentials that mm -hmm. has been instilled in them when we don't involve them? So really, uh, uh, that one thing I would tell my my own, if I meet a policymaker, see, you need to invest, you need to invest, you need to let them participate in education. You need to invest in it. Rebecca, um, you you talked uh, so passionately about inclusion and uh, um, unemployment right now due to COVID as well. Companies would at this point would try to think, you know, let us hire people who are, you know able like normally able who doesn't have a diff different label or disable uh, however you want to phrase it um so how do you tell companies that you know what let's not be discriminatory in our hiring right now these people have equally the potential of someone who's different than them so is this something companies or governments are understanding right now or they're just focusing on just survival let's like just employ whatever we have right now uh let's not think about creating jobs for people who are different or let's just, just be on a survival mode right now. I guess economies are essentially on survival mode. How do we shift from that survival thinking to a more inclusive mindset and a more thriving uh, outcome? Like, like, like I mentioned earlier, if we see the, the problem, it's, it's more of a foundational problem. Before organizations can even focus on that inclusive setting, it's 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 gonna take a while, but it's achievable. It's achievable. So we need to start from the roots. You know, I've I've seen a lot of people living with disability have potentials. I've seen a lot of deaf people doing great things. I've seen them write poetry that that I, I I'm I'm amazed that a hearing folk might cannot even do what they have done. I've seen them I've seen them you know develop ideas, and I'm like, oh wow. What's going on? This is big, but because they've been sidelined, they have been sidelined. So the, the, the organizations out there are not even paying attention to them. They are not paying attention. They seem to let them, you know, they seem to see less of them and focus on what is out there. Like you said, Survivor, they are focusing more on what is out there or oh, what do we have out there. And even what we have out there, they, they, there is still not enough for those people out there. There is still not enough. So it's, it, that one is a major problem on its own. So I'm going to come back to this. We need to like um, look at it this way. From the foundation, we don't even have development programs for these people. Now I'm talking about people living, we don't even have develop, like they are short of development programs. They are, they, they, the opportunities are very, you know, it's very, very low. So I'm going to tell organizations out there, can you, can you, even if it's a small fragment or you know, percentage of your, you know, funding investment, Give them a platform, give them an opportunity and see what they can do. And I assure you, it won't be a waste. Give them a platform. You'll be surprised the, the kind of returns, the, the, the productivity you will get with them 
without even comparing them with other people. I'm not going to compare, but you will be surprised. We need to set that platform. We need to lay, you know, we, we need to lay that foundation. And that is the problem. We don't have the foundation. The, 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 the government has not done its own part in laying that foundation that will let them be seen. So they are not seen. And very little of them are, are, are seen. And if you look at most of the opportunities, I have a lot of them as friends. And if you see the mm. many opportunities they have, it, 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 they are mostly international. They really get even good national opportunities. They are mostly international opportunities, which are not very much for a whole lot of them that are here. So I will say it again. I'm going to tell the government, you need to play your part. Let them right. be seen. Set a platform that will let them be seen. Then you can see these private organizations. They will be willing. Give them, give them that ground. Let it, let them be out there. And you know, the, the private organizations won't be able to ignore. They will be like, oh, they are there. Oh, we're seeing what they can do. Oh, oh, oh. And you know, opportunities those will just open naturally. It will open up. Interesting. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for your views. Um, I just want to shift to uh, Christian right now. Uh, you were, you were mentioning. Uh, about climate uh, change, climate activism, and due to the COVID, I guess our focus is just on um, health, but it def definitely relates uh, to climate change as well. Are we ignoring other issues right now, especially climate change due to um, the health, the pandemic, the employment, the economy crisis? We just feel that, you know, we have to focus on this. Let's just get the get the economy GDP up and then focus on climate. But then it's all interrelated. You cannot ignore and prioritize. So as, as a teacher and as someone who's so passionate about this, how do you see the intersection uh, of this two or three areas? And how do you think uh, you should be like on the forefront advocating for this before things go something like on, on, on the wrong way? And if it goes on the wrong way, there's no turning back for a long time. Yeah, yeah, terrific question. Uh, and to be very clear, I don't by any means want to downplay the danger and the significance of the pandemic and what it poses. But you are very right that because we have shifted so much attention and so much money to it and also to the economic crisis and the, the social crisis more broadly, which has emerged from it, we have inevitably shifted some focus away from other areas which are absolutely crucial right now. I wanna give one example. There was a study that came out a few weeks ago which showed that there was a correlation between COVID cases and certain types of farm-based chemicals in the Netherlands. And so in areas where you had a lot of these chemicals, you had higher rates of the coronavirus. And not to speak from this from, uh, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not an expert on this to be very clear, but that example demonstrates that there is an intersection between climate and health. And this is even more pronounced when you consider other viruses and other diseases which affect us as well. One of the things that has perhaps received a bit less attention, um, which could have some quite deadly consequences over the coming years, is that many people have chosen not to seek treatment for other diseases such as tuberculosis and cancer, and that could have quite significant consequences. However, on the flip side, there are also some positives which have emerged from this. Uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but one of the things that you've seen is an enormous investment in medical technology to conquer and to defeat this virus. And that technology, while it is today designed to defeat the coronavirus, might in a few years or even a few months be transformed to be able to fight some of the other diseases and other health issues which we face on a daily basis. A very similar phenomenon happened during the First and Second World War, where many technologies were developed in order to fight war. But after the war, these technologies were converted into many of the uh, things that we today take for granted, like airplanes, computers, and the internet. So out of this kind of uh, massive crisis, a lot of technologies can emerge which can help us in the future. I wanna bring another example to this. While there has been an enormous focus on the pandemic and on uh, the economy, you're also seeing, not only in specific countries, but I think broadly speaking across the world, a movement to defeat 
racism and other forms of disc other forms of discrimination. Uh, in the United States, where I where I grew up and where I've spent a large portion of my life, this has played a massive role through the Black Lives Matter movement, which has also spread to uh, parts of Europe and throughout the entire world. And that is a really, really terrific thing that despite everything else going on in the world, people are still so passionate and want to turn this passion into advocacy. And I think that is something that you should keep in mind if you're a young person or an organization or a company out there and you want to do everything you can to defeat the pandemic and to defeat the economic crisis. Think about different ways. Is there a portion of your business or is there a portion of your work which you maybe can also apply to fighting some of your other, um, fighting some of your other passions. Maybe you're really passionate about uh, education, and so you're developing a platform which allows people in your area to have some type of distance learning because they can't be in person. Maybe you can then transform that platform either now or in the future into something bigger, which can connect with people um, like Rebecca mentioned who have certain types of disabilities. That could be a great opportunity for you to both you know, fight the pandemic and the crisis and to also achieve some of your other goals. And so that is some of the ways where, where you can kind of tackle two, two things at once. Thank you so much for that, Christian. I mean, uh, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, as much as it's, it's the pandemic has shifted our attention to the whole health, uh, health crisis, but there, it also poses, uh, posed a whole lot of opportunities. I mean, there is a um, sense of protectionism and um, just being on a survival mode, but also um, we as employees or we as um, students, we as employers, uh, we can advocate. I mean, in my country, I I know in my hospital where I work, uh, we have been adv advocating for um, investment in, in uh, upskilling right now. Um, so so that people are shifting from one kind of jobs to another and the skills they would be requiring for the future. Uh, I know in some countries uh, where they lost their jobs, women were the first in the front run of um, on the layoff. Um, in company where I work, uh, women were being actually promoted to managerial roles. So it, it comes from just being able to put that view out there that if you think this is this is what works, but there's another way of getting it done, and there is value to that as well. So I'm I'm, I'm grateful of for you to to share that. And on that, I just want to shift gears uh, to three of our panelists right now uh, before we kind of sign off um, with my last question. Um, so you three of you like tapped into your inner strength and your qualification uh, to kind of bring about and create value uh, into your lives and the lives of others. Um, I just want to understand how important it was for all of three of you to understand and identify your strengths and your weaknesses and kind of work on that. And what would you advise young people who feel that they're not important enough to create a change in their society. I just want to understand your journey to who you were before you started uh, making a difference to where who you are right now. So I just want to start with maybe Lillian. Rebecca? I hope you could hear me. Oh. Oh. Yes, I can. I can. Okay. All right. So, first of all, there is key in information. There is power in information. <laughs> Youth needs to be formed. In as much as information might be restricted, yes, when I say restricted, based on setting, based on where you were from. That means you don't have easy access to this information. It's very hard when you don't have easy access to this information, but try as much as possible to be informed. And I'm talking about making use of your, you know, easy platforms out there. Google, um, other websites of interest. Then as well, Networking, networking is very important. But before I go into that, let me start with, 
I didn't always from the beginning have this strength, of course. It took a while before I discovered them. And I would say the key to me discovering them was volunteering. A lot of people don't know the power in volunteering. They don't know. But there is a lot to benefit from volunteering. The day I made up my mind to volunteer, I, I discovered myself. It was as if uh, a, a void was opened. You know, I got to meet youth from different community. Okay, fortunately for me, I got to volunteer on uh, on an exchange program that's with some of the um, UK volunteers. So we had like an exchange. We lived together in a community, in a rural community for three months. And I would say that journey was a life opening one for me. It, it changed the person I was. It made me discover my passion. You know, before going into it, I had this passion, but I could don't place it. It was as if it wasn't strong enough. It was as if it wasn't valid enough. I didn't even know where I fit. So I was just teaching. I was like, okay, as well as I'm impacting, you know, some set of people, I think I'm good. Until I started having this desire to do more. I wanted to do more. And volunteering opened that door for me. And volunteering made me to understand, I said, the more you give, the more you give, the more it benefits you. You know, the more you impact, the more you are opening doors for yourself. The more you teach, the more you know. So have this mentality of service. Having a mentality of service, it's, 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 it's a knowledge impact journey for you. So start from where you are, you know, your locality. Find somewhere where you can, you know, volunteer. And I, 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 I would... I would always tell people, don't say you don't have anything. That's not true. You have something. It no matter how little it is, how little, there's something there. Even if you feel like it's not enough, see, just find somewhere where you can give it. And that is your path to self-discovery. Because if you don't give anything, you wouldn't know that you even have some of them. If you don't, you know, go out there to... Show people what you have in you. Oh, I can do this, I can do this. You won't even know well enough about them. It was not until when I started volunteering that someone told me, oh, you, you, you talk, you, 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 you sound like an inspiring person. I like it when you talk, you sound so inspiring. And I'm like, oh, really? I didn't know I had that. I just knew I was a teacher and my students love listening to me when I teach, but I didn't know that. Oh, you, you, you have this leadership capacity. I didn't know that. So when you give yourself the opportunity to, you know, like I said, information is key. And even with this information, don't just stay where you are. Don't sit in your comfort zone. Go out there. See, this opportunity, this information won't come and meet you where you are. Get up. Go out there. Look for opportunities. In as much as, like, the, the, um, the program I volunteered for, I'm not sure it's currently in Nigeria. It's, it's stopped in Nigeria already. But there are all the platforms. There are all that the SDG, you know, the youth SDG program in Nigeria. There are ways you, you can volunteer with them. There are some NGOs they need volunteers. See, just go there. Don't go there with the mentality of, oh, I, I, I want to get. Go there with the mentality of, I want to give as much as I can give. And the moment you are doing that, see, you're going to receive as much as you didn't expect to receive. So... It still boils down to information and mm -hmm. as well. One thing I want you to know is that no matter how little that thing that you have seem, it fits into somewhere, into the, the sustainable development goals. It's, it fits into somewhere. We have 17 development goals and 169 targets. Come on, you fit somewhere. So don't think, oh, it's it's not unique. It's not it's nothing. You fit into somewhere. So just Get informed. Do you know? Do research. It doesn't have to vig be vigorous. Just do your little research, and you will find your niche. You will find yourself. You'll be able to place yourself somewhere. And the moment you place yourself there, the moment you find that place, t believe me, you are you are on a pace. You are you are going, and higher and higher, you will surely be going. Thank you so much, Rebecca. In order to give, you need to have. In order to realize that you have. You have to focus on yourself and, and, and invest in yourself as well. That is beautiful. Um, Christian, uh, I just want to quote Lao Zhu over here. If you understand others, you're smart. If you understand yourself, you're illuminated. So how has been the journey for you so far? How, uh, how important do you think it is, has been for you? And it is important for others. I just want to begin by saying terrific, uh, terrifically well said by Rebecca and really inspiring. I think especially this notion of you fit somewhere is key for myself and i think for many others 
it's a process, it's a journey. And I think that's one of the things that I really want to emphasize. And whenever I talk to people about this is never feel like you need to get to an end destination or that you have come to a kind of an end goal and now you stop developing and now you stop growing. You're always on a process of growth and development. One of the things that I like to uh, think uh, is this concept of comparative advantage. If you've studied economics, you know what I'm talking about. It's this idea that uh, you're, you should focus on the thing that you're, that you're really good at, and then you can trade that service with things that other people are really good at. And so you get the maximize, you maximize your joint benefit. For myself, growing up, I always had these different interests, and I wasn't entirely sure how I was going to connect them. I, I was really interested in economics and, and good at math, and I, I liked history and politics and, and journalism. And the step and the steps and the processes that I took, working through different organizations, um, uh, being a, a sports journalist and a sports blogger for a long time, these were all part of my journey in getting to the point where eventually I realized that my real passion was about European and transatlantic affairs and about youth affairs and youth involvement more broadly on a global scale. And I didn't realize that until about three, four years ago that that was what I was really passionate about. And it was just like Rebecca said, it was through reaching out to different people, having different types of discussions, traveling, uh, attending conferences and learning that I was able to move on in my process and to come to the point where I later on then developed this notion of this is what I'm passionate about. This is what I want to do. And you might be watching this and you might be thinking, these are some great tips, but how, I don't know how to figure out what I want to do. I don't know what it is that I want to do, what my passion is. And I recommend that you uh, take out a piece of paper. You can do it right now or in a little bit. And you make two columns, one column with skills and one with passions. And in the skills column, you write down your top three skills. So for myself, one of them is writing. Maybe for you, you're a great coder or you're great at uh, visual graphics, whatever it may be, write down your three best skills. Then you want to write down on the other in the other column, you want to write down what are your three passions, the, the, the big areas of interest that you are passionate about. Maybe it's the environment, maybe it's education, maybe it's international trade, whatever it may be. Write those three down and then think, okay, what of my skills, how can I combine them best to fit one of these three. So maybe I can combine them best to work towards education, or maybe I can combine them best to work towards coding, wh whatever it may be. And this can help visualize for yourself what it is that you should focus on. And I just want to finish by reiterating actually what Rebecca said, that you fit somewhere. And this is a process, you know, you're not going to get to the point one day, you're not going to wake up and feel, ah, I've made it. I know what I want to do. It's always about learning and always about gaining new opportunities. And by doing so, you will be able to figure out exactly how you can be engaged. And that's exactly what I think the journey that we've all taken here. Christian, thank you so much for that practical advice. Um, I, I kind of relate to what you said. Uh, I moved from media to healthcare and one of the, um, the, the normal narration was that healthcare was something uh, very different, difficult industry. It's not gonna match where you're coming from. But then it was really about upskilling and knowing where my strength lies and how I can kind of translate to uh, value into healthcare. So I, I kind of relate to what you're saying and kind of identifying your strengths, knowing who you are. And it, it is a process uh, and you would fail and it's it's OK to fail and it's, it's normal to just get up and try again and be very specific about identifying your strengths and knowing who you are. Uh, I just want to shift to Lillian with the same question. I hope I can get her back on air. Uh, Lillian? Yes. Well, with my journey, it has been, I think art has always been a, co a constant. I mean, through growing up, uh, growing up, I, from primary school, I, I just drew faces. I just had a pencil. I could just sketch something out of, out of my just out of nowhere and growing up i saw shading and i just wanted to shade uh, adding up i can say you can just start where you end with what you have I, I i remember at some point when i i started drawing i always complained i don't have pencils i just have a ihb pencil but then with while me complaining i i, I realized that i was doing what I, I i was starting where i was and with what i had 
and without what I had, it it was able to build me and get me more materials and grow with also my art for it to grow. And with string art, I mean, I can say that believe in yourself. I mean, when you want to do something and if you're going to try, you just go all the way. If you're going to try, go all the way. With string art, I saw a string art and I, I decided that I'm going to try this. And when I tried it, it was, I went all the way. I From there, it was, for me, it, 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 was, a, it was a starting point. I, I the first the first piece produced another piece and another piece and another piece. So for me, all I can say is that believe in yourself. And another thing you can you should never compare yourself to somebody. If you're going to do something, just if you're going to to look at what somebody else is doing, just look to learn and to just to learn and but do not to compare yourself. When you compare yourself, I mean. You will always, you'll feel really low. You'll feel like you're doing nothing. And that is so discouraging and, overpower, and uh, it, will, it will overpower you and you will not be able to do anything feeling like you're just doing nothing. So you should never compare yourself to, any, to anyone. That is such a beautiful message, uh, Lillian. I mean, focusing on yourself, on your strength uh, and just be who you are and be the bring that value out for society and not comparing. Uh, it gives you that mental ease and peace to kind of focus and foster your inner strengths. And the moment you compare, as you said, it it, it kinds of shift your uh, priorities. It means you're not being grateful to what you have, who to who you are, and it kind of uh, diminishes your vibration and your, the value and the focus you should be creating on yourself. And that's such a beautiful message. Um, on that note, I just want to ask uh, one last question to three of you, uh, since it's International Youth Day panelist and you all have such amazing background, doing such amazing work. Uh, if you could just give three action lists to youth today, anywhere in the world, whether it's in your country or to global youth, what would you ask them to do? Just three action lists. Uh, I would start with Mary Christian. Well, for youth across the world, I think there's three things that you can do to, in whatever field you're working in, to maximize your effectiveness and to have the biggest impact. Number one, kind of going back to what we just spoke about, unify your skills and your passion. If you're passionate about something and it's something that you have a lot of skill in, you're gonna be churning out a really good product. And you can also think about this at an organizational level, combine the skills of your organization and of your employees or members with the passion that they're, that they're all really passionate about. That's number one. Number two, raise awareness. Even on some big issues like the climate where we think that you know people know about this issue, people care, and that is true, many people do, but you can always raise more awareness. And this is even more important on issues which are less discussed, on issues which do not receive the same media attention, especially in the big medias. And as such, always focus on raising awareness through social media, blog posts, articles, whatever it may be. And there's a lot of opportunity for this, especially right now in this very digital world that we live in. And then lastly, also going back a little bit to what we spoke about earlier, collaborate. Always try to collaborate with other youth organizations, with other organizations irrespective of the age of its members, and to maximize the ability that you both can, uh, of the things you both can achieve. So maybe your organization is really good at visual, uh, visual graphics and about visualizing the work of others, and someone else has this, is really good at collecting and analyzing data you can then combine the data that they have with the graphics that you're able to produce to produce the something that is really good, that raises awareness to the issue that you're working on. For instance, maybe it's um, child care in your country. Uh, and then you're using the skills and your passions and you're really amplifying this and you're working towards your goals. And so that is what I encourage everyone to do. Combine your skills and your passions, raise awareness and collaborate. Brilliant, thank you, Christian. Uh, I, I really appreciate the input that you gave on Collaborate. Uh, during COVID, I think collaboration has really come into the front front because a lot of 
businesses and organizations um, are lacking finance and uh, revenue. So they're creating value uh, through collaboration and it's just so important right now. I just wanna to shift to Lillian, um, if you could give three advice to youth in your country or globally. Um, for I, I would like to share a, a, a little story. I mean, a man was jogging and saw this man fishing and this man was throwing the big fish and just, when he catches the big fish, he throws them and kept only the small fish. And when the, the man asked him, why are you throwing this big fish? And the man would say, I don't have a bigger pan at home. I would like to compare this with our mental, mental capabilities. I mean, with us thinking. You know, if you're going to think and if you're going to want something, you have got to think big and you have to think positive. If the fish is big, you could always just chop it into small pieces to, to, to fit it in a, in, a, in a pan where you're going to fry them or cook them. So for starting, I would like to, tell, to, to share with them that they should think big and they should think greater and they should never minimize. I mean, they should ask when opportunities come, they should also grab them with, with bigger hands. And lastly, I would like to advise them is that they should do more. So thinking big and greater, when opportunities come, they are going to come. Just grab them with open hearts. Yes, don't think, don't 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 say that ah, this opportunity, this this I can do this, I can do that. You could just always learn to do something and just do it. And when you're going to do it, just do it more and more and more. Do not just don't settle for less. Just do it more and more and more. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian, so much. Really appreciate that. Um, Rebecca, I would like to shift towards you. Three practical action advice you can give to youth on International Youth Day. You're beautiful. So, um, number one, um, I said this earlier on, and I'm going to say it again. Be informed. Be informed. In as much as it might be hard to get the necessary information you need, be informed. And this COVID-19 era has actually made it so easy. I can put it tell you that I've, I've, had, I've done like more than five courses online. Free, free courses. If you go on LinkedIn, you're going to see a lot of free courses that you can do in your own development. You know, you, you can find some course that interests you. Now I'm talking about in terms of your own development. So be informed. Find, uh, find, you know, go to places where that 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 will benefit you, where you can find things that will interest you and that will develop you. So LinkedIn has that platform. Udemy, you have Coursera. They have a lot of free courses. And Coursera just brought out a new course recently which um, on advocacy. So I'm talking about go out there, go online. COVID-19 has made it easy. So go online, go out there, search for things that can help in your development and develop yourself. So information has a lot to do with this. Number two, networking. Networking is very important. So I never knew the Magni the magnitude of this until recently. Networking is very important. So every opportunity you have to network with someone that happens to be doing something similar to what you're doing, take advantage of it. See, find a way to know how to make use of your LinkedIn profile. I just got to know that recently through uh, one of my mentorship programs. My mentor taught me. And I, I was amazed at how you could network with people that, that seem so far. And suddenly they are near with your LinkedIn profile, even with your Instagram. But Instagram might be limited, you know, to some aspect. Facebook, because I'm saying this because it has worked for me. I've had someone reach out to me on Facebook and we partnered together on a project this year, you know, during this COVID 19 era where funds seem so, you know, everyone seems to be managing. We had enough funds to, 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 to put food palliatives to, to more than to 20 women. I might not have been able to do this on my own, but someone reached out to me. I had someone on my network, you know, just someone that saw what I was doing and reached out to me. So another you can also network is put yourself out there. So let me tell you one, one truth today. If you stop putting yourself out there, it's natural for people to forget. People forget, so it's natural. So don't make it look like, oh, uh, when I put myself out there too much, people will tend to think that I'm all in their face. Oh, come on. 
as far as you're putting something good in their faces, something good, not just something irrelevant, put something good in their face. You know, show your work, tell them what you're doing. Every in and out, I, I don't know how often you want to do it. Like for me, I make sure like twice a week, sometimes twice a week. Sometimes I just write, you know, a, a, a um, topic of interest that I want people to engage in. See, put yourself out there. Don't let people forget you. So when they don't forget you, you know, it's kind of expand. It keeps expanding your network. And you, you see that people send you friend requests. See, try and don't, don't be that person that when, you, when they send you friend requests, you just overlook it. I used to be like that. Don't overlook those friend requests. Some of them are people that will be that will, that will be useful to your journey. They are people that you really need to connect to. So check their profile. Oh, are they the kind of people I want to connect with? Then, you know, add them into your network immediately. And number three, um, like Kristen said, is very important. Collaboration, partnership. Oh my, that the power of that, that tool cannot be overemphasized. Partner. So if you have a network, you, you, your partnership might be limited. So that is why I said net, um, youth network number two. Then number three, partnership. Collaborate with them. Don't just have them there in your, in your, in your inbox, in your, you know, on your Facebook, following you on your LinkedIn, and you're not making use of it. Look at what they are doing. Don't just, don't just be that person that has a profile page and you're doing nothing. Go there. Go and look at what these people are, are doing. I'm sure you didn't um, just accept them as people into your profile. They, are, they must be doing something good. You, you, you have interest in them. So find out what they're doing and see how it can work with what you were doing. You know, reach out with them with great ideas and you'll be surprised how it will turn out to work for you eventually because it's working for me. Um... We have uh, one question. I think we want to share it before we sign it off. Um, I would, how can young people get a seat at the table in regions where their voices are not valued? Um, Christian, do you want to shed light on that before we sign off? Yeah, so this is actually something that I've worked on quite closely or and also have heard of a lot of organizations which do. In Europe, of course, if you're not familiar, uh, you have the European Parliament and the European Commission which are supranational organizations which work with all member states and have members from all member states in the European Union. And so these organizations work from people from different from across different regions. And youth organizations to be able to influence and to have a concrete voice in these organizations have had to organize across borders. And I think this is really important. You need to not only organize and organize effectively, but you need to organize in each country. So for instance, there is a youth organization called the European Youth Forum uh, in Europe. And what they do is they hold events for young people from all across Europe and they bring people into events and they educate members. And then through, these, through this, they also produce reports and other forms of publications, which they then use to influence very actively the European Parliament. There's also the European Youth Parliament, which teaches its members uh, it's very similar to uh, model United Nations, if you're familiar with that, teaches its members how to be a parliamentarian. And this equips them with the, with the skills to then hopefully in the future actually become parliamentarians and to also influence. And lastly, I think if, if we step out of Europe for a moment and think a little bit more broadly about the world, how can you do this in other regions? I think, number one, you in your organization need to not only collaborate with people from other countries and other uh, people in other regions, depending on what area you're focusing on, of course, you also need to work with other organizations because to influence politics and policy at a regional level, it is really difficult and it requires a very concerted long-term effort. And so you need to collaborate with other organizations. And then number two, I think you really need to think about advocacy. So producing reports, uh, having campaigns when you advocate for a particular policy, those can be more effective than trying to have meetings or conferences even because they can raise awareness to the broader public uh, of what you're doing. And within the case of COVID-19 where, where we are right now, I think there is an opportunity for this in the, in the sense that uh, there's a lot of people who are working from home. It's a very digitized environment. so you as a youth organization can try to collaborate with other organizations, maybe produce some of these reports or advocacy tools and can then have an impact at the regional level. 
Christian, thank you so much for that. I'm afraid we need to end this over here. I wish we could go on. Um, on that note, I would like to thank our panelists, Christian, Rebecca, and Lillian, and thank the uh, ODISC team on the background who's doing so much work. As always, you can go to uh, ODESC Twitter. You can share your comments and thoughts on this panel, uh, panel that we had today. Uh, you can also visit the website for all the opportunities. Um, uh, you know, you can have access to both regionally and internationally. I would just say that I actually uh, applied for two opportunities within the last three years, and I think I got two of them. So it's an amazing wealth of information online that ODESC shares and just access it online whenever you have time. Uh, on that note, I just want to thank our team, thank viewers. I wish you a beautiful day and a weekend. Um, just want to share something, uh, a code that I learned, uh, one of my teachers used to say, uh, the law of gratitude says that you attract what you give. So whatever you give, give it with the intention of love. And on that note, I wish 